Our mission is to bring together the best venture capitalists to compete so you have the insights on how to invest with the best. I'm Olivia O'Sullivan. I work at Forum Ventures. We're an early stage B2B SaaS fund. Uh, we help founders from zero to scale. So we have a studio fund, we have an accelerator fund, and a traditional seed fund. Um, we are very much generalists, but we love to invest in supply chain and logistics, e-commerce enablement, applied AI, and healthcare. Hey everybody, I'm Nahal, the de defending this. <laughs> That's it. Hi everyone, I'm Nia Johnson, recent gra MBA graduate from Columbia Business School, um, building a blog called How to Find a Party, basically focused on the intersection of consumer tech and emerging tech, and, and all the, to all your investors there, if you need someone on your team looking for a job. <laughs> Hi, my name is Olin Douglas. I'm an advisor and former managing partner for a firm called Motley Fool Ventures. I'm um, glad to be here for today because I'm bringing my A game. I want to roll out my game show name. So for tonight, I am, I am Daddy O. Daddy O. <laughs> Man. Daddy O is here. It's stiff competition. <laughs> All right, so we're going to start off with the first question. It's a macro, crush, uh, macro question. What's going on in the world? Steve Cohen, buddy of mine. I don't know if you guys know him. Steve, uh, SAC Capital, Point Seventy Two, owner of the Mets. I used to wait his table in Stanford. No big deal. We're buddies. Gave me tickets to the Yankees game one time. Yep, yep, humble brag. Anyways, he's bullish on AI uh, and thinks that investors should ride the wave. What should investors consider when making a bet on AI during this frenzied environment? And will the AI bubble be bigger shit show than the dot-com bubble? Nahal, you're the defending champion. Start us off. All right. Um, so, yeah, my quick background, by the way, uh, five-time founder and then started co-founded a fund called ENIAC Ventures uh, 14 years ago. And uh, we've made about 200-ish investments. But we started, uh, why it's relevant here, it's we started during the internet boom, 99. And then we witnessed the mobile boom in 2008, 2009, post App Store, uh, then cloud, and now AI. AI's been around for a while. Obviously, there's a lot of interesting why now is why it's blowing up at this moment, specifically GPU. If anybody holds NVIDIA stock today, they saw 30% increase in value. It's a trillion dollar company, which is wild. They just created the chips that powers AI. But AI is very much a real thing. It's been around for a while, but it's actually practically tangible and executable now. It's not just the chat GPT. That's the tip of the spear. Um, it's making everything incredibly more efficient. And so we love investing in SaaS businesses built on cutting edge AI because it makes everything literally 10% of the cost. Um, so it is as big, I think, as the dot-com boom of the early 2000s, as the mobile boom in, 20, in the 2010s. And of course, there'll be a lot of uh, zeros that are being created now, but there'll be a lot, the next generation of unicorns and decacorns. So we're, we're pretty excited by it. All right, Olivia, what do you think here? Well, Stephen Cohen is thinking about it as a hedge fund manager, so he's thinking about it as profit margins. Obviously, if you're thinking about the macroeconomic climate right now, you know, the Fed has been continually hiking up interest rates. Inflation is still high. We are, like, nearing the X date when the United States is going to default on their debt. But he sees, you know, if you're a hedge fund manager and you're doing your job well, you're looking at all of the different things that are happening in the macro climate and saying, how is this going to impact business? And so he sees that artificial intelligence, much like you said, is going to drive down operation costs, is going to lower the need for headcount, and that's going to drive profit margins at Forum. We love to invest in applied AI businesses. I think good advice for investors is to continue to be disciplined in your ownership targets and valuations and invest in sectors that you have deep knowledge in and that AI can be applied in that. Olin? Um, it's a similar uh, uh, response to her. I think as investors, um, if you are in the private markets, uh, find first question you should ask is, where's your expertise? Where's your knowledge? Where's your interest? Is it in the research side? Is it in the applied side? Is it B to B, B to C? And then follow those, um, follow that into the uh, arena to find the companies that, that are going to resonate the best with you. And if you're interested in AI, I think we all agree it's a big deal, um, but you don't really have that expertise. Stay out of the private markets. Go 
type in Google top five or biggest companies by market cap, and every single one of them just buy them. Apple, Amazon, they all you these. Type it in Chat GPT, <laughs> maybe. <you know? laughs> yeah, and, and yeah. <laughs> and um, as far as uh, what kind of show this is going to be <laughs> going forward, I, what I think is that. Um, we all sense a little rumbling in the tummy. I was around in 2001 as well. I think it's just early. It's just really too early to tell whether that show is going to be like just the runs or we're going to have a full explosion kind of coming up <laughs> later. So, <laughs> Nia, what do you think? I think it, for me, it can go either way. Like personally, I think that VC has a very bad habit of cycling through trends without much due diligence, and I think that is a result of a lot of things. I think, including the fact that we've had a really, really long bull market, like that we just came out of. So I think that there just has been like an emphasis on chasing deals over just full diligence, and I think we've seen this with the whole Web three stuff. <laughs> um, I would say that if we focus, if like VCs focus on like more diligence over chasing deals, then I think that AI could be a very good, helpful thing. But I think if we sit here and just like go through the FOMO, go who's the hot founder, then we're just gonna put, have like SBF, but AI. <laughs> uh, we'll make this easy. We're gonna open up the, the voting. Nadal, this is like a little test round. There you go, you got the QR code. Everyone's gonna scan that QR code. It's gonna bring you to Slido. It's also in front of you as well. That's uh, mm -hmm. on that sheet. So you could vote who wins this round. But is there anything we missed? Why AI is gonna fall apart? I mean, I don't know, the bust, or like, Anybody want to steal this round, essentially? I'd like your comment on kind of Steve Cohen from the hedge fund perspective. I think one word is uh, that he uses a lot, a lot of the hedge fund managers use a lot, is that AI is deflationary. And that it's creating, it's like literally the opposite effect of what's happening in our economy. And that could potentially save like this next wave of, of GDP creation, you know, um, in a dramatic way. But yeah, that was the quote you pulled in, in the question, is like why he's bullish on AI, is it's going to be deflationary in the current market. Do uh, you want to show the results for the first question, which is kind of like a popularity contest, which we've seen in the past? I'm, I'm going to guess <laughs> Nahal's winning this question. Okay, we got 28, 30 people in there. Uh, that's, that's, it's a little bit of a popularity. It was, it was good answers, but it was a little bit of popularity. So I do suggest... You know, you, you could go against the hall, even if you came here for him, you know. We're going to move on to the second round. And the question is, how should founders structure their fundraise? Are there specific strategies on what you see the best founders implement to gain momentum, to close their round uh, within a t desired time frame? Olin, you start this one off, please. Sure. Um, what I've seen, and kind of um, narrowed it down to three things that, that I see work over and over again. First of all, you start... Uh, with telling a compelling story. And it's a story where your passion shows up, where, where you believe in it. The second thing is to make sure that you have evidence that you are the one that can execute that beautiful vision that you need. And then the third step is really the one that most people miss is finding your tribe. Um, if that person you're talking to doesn't invest in what you're doing, you're never gonna convince them. The whole idea is to find people who are excited about what you are doing because those are gonna be the people who are the best investors, the best funders, the best supporters because they are aligned with you from the beginning. Nia. Um, I think I've seen the most effective founders do three things. Like I think they have a good understanding of like what VC is and how it is as a business because like we are a business, we, have, or we look for certain qualities in startups that will further that business and, you, and they have an understanding of whether that aligns with what they what their vision of the business is so like if you are a let's say a makeup company like that's a lot of variable costs that's a lot of like yeah that's a lot of variable costs and that's something that's antithetical to like the venture model because we want like huge hyper growth scale so like we you want something you that might not be aligned and that's okay but you just don't want a, your business to like turn into something that you didn't envision it to be I would say the second thing would be to build VC relationships at VC like before you start fundraising and connect on like a human level rather than just like, hey, like I think no one like wants to go to a networking thing because I think networking is really just a professionally making friends. So I think if you can like connect with people on a human level, then it just makes fundraising a lot easier. And I think the third thing I think I am in agreement with you is that you're very targeted in who you approach and just like very researched, very like 
targeted on like, okay, does this fit my thesis? Does this person's thesis fit my business? Um, what did they? What their? What are their interests? What are their interests? And like, um, what is their thesis on the space? And like, does it make sense? And just a lot of research. So I think it's just a mix. Beautiful. No, I'll keep. We'll keep coming down this row. Yeah, I, lo I love what you said about uh, building those relationships early. I think the best founders meet uh, their investors and even the companies that might acquire them years before that actually happens. Um, it's ironic that in a period of a few weeks, you meet your, literally the person you marry, right, your investor actually often lasts longer than most marriages for 10, 15, 20 years, right, over a period of weeks. Like imagine courting, you know, your, sp your future spouse in like a week and uh, being married for, I mean, that's what it's like. So take time to get to know each other beforehand. Um, and then one, one thought we had, you know, we focused a lot on converting C to A. And our most successful founders have run it on their own timeline versus the VC timeline. And what that means is having the founder control the ball and control the game and don't lose control of that. And so the best founders, for example, we, we just had a founder um, with multiple term sheets this week in this market. And what they did was they said, all right, this month, this was January, we're going to take coffee chats. Okay, February, we're going to do partner meetings. Uh, March, the data room's open. And April 15th is the deadline for term sheets. And they made this very clear to everybody in the process. And so they ran it on their schedule. It was their game. They control the ball. And founders that can do that um, often have great success because VCs, we're the worst. You know, we're literally the worst. Like, we'll do whatever it takes to just buy more time, right? Because more time equals more diligence, equals more work. And we're never really under pressure unless it's a competitive situation, like with Web3 and there's no diligence and it's just crazy time. And that's why, and that's why that didn't really fare that well. Uh, yeah, we did not. <laughs> But anyway, my, my point is the best founders control the game of fundraising. And we don't often see that, but when it works, it works. Well, kudos to your company for all the term sheets. It is a super challenging macro environment to be fundraising. Fundraising is hard no matter what. Um, as an early stage investor, my job is to take calculated risks. And so I think the best thing a founder can do is de-risk your business. Um, that might mean you have 20 years of industry experience um, in the domain that you're selling in. It might mean that you have raised venture capital or have exited a previous business. It might mean that you have traction. All of those things are great. Um, anything that you can do to de-risk a business for an early stage investor makes our decision easier. The other piece of advice I always give to founders is run your fundraising process like a sales process. So that means create all your materials, you know, you got a target list of investors you want to connect to, you're going to have a fundraising pipeline. And I think there's an unfortunate power dynamic between investors and founders. Investors are the worst. Um, but just like you would in a sales discovery call where you're trying to figure out like, okay, who has the buying authority here? What is your process for purchasing my software? Like, what is this going to look like from our call today to like, if you buy this, you should be able to feel empowered to do the same thing as a founder during a call with an investor of like, if you love this business, what does this process look like? Who's going to be brought into the conversations about how long is the timeline going to go? And if someone is kind of kicking the can down the road, put them in your like keeping warm bucket and start to have more meaningful conversations. Don't let someone drag you for six months. Nadal, put the QR code up. There, this was such an easy thing. You guys could have just said, come to primetime VC events. Do a pitch like Chisa. And then I would just, I, got, I could have the ability to rig this, all right? The funny so. thing is I put that in my notes. I said, like, go to primetime VC yeah. events. But I didn't say it, but it was so, in my it's notes. All right. It's all right. You could still steal around. It's all right. Uh, you guys could need to disagree at times, too. That would be nice. You guys could go after each other. That's, that, that would help. I don't know. But it's all right. We're going to do the voting. Is there anybody disagreeing with anybody? Is there anything we missed here? Fundraising is very hard right now. It's the hardest it's been in a very long time. So, um, yeah, it's, that's all I have to say. I think the only thing I'll add is not every founder can run a, a process on their own timeline because sometimes you just don't have the traction to be able to raise money. Like, in challenging macro environments, the reality is, like, people are being much more diligent in terms of the checks that they're writing, and so not everyone can run a fundraising process on their own timeline. If you have things that are de-risking the business in great traction, amazing. You probably can schedule your coffee chats, then your partner meetings, everything closes April 15th, but that's not the case for most people. 
Yeah, I have to agree with that. I think I've seen like way too many founders like rush to raising money without like a good proof of concept. And like a proof of concept doesn't have to be fancy. It can be just something very low res. Like I think I saw like a con like a prototype of a consumer app that was just all over to all just on SMS and it proved it. They had the numbers and they were more likely to get funded. It was like we had to kind of like fight and we didn't get it, but like still like you have that traction versus like somebody who just comes up with a deck and is like, give me money. Like try to do as much as you can without money before get, getting money. And uh, lastly, I would say um, just separate, a little bit, not everyone has a network. And especially if you're an early stage founder, when you come from, not everyone does it. So, so sometimes this idea of finding, um, you know, leaning into your network just kind of falls flat because where do you start from? And that's why I said the first like find your tr your tribe. So tonight, your tribe is primetime VC. You know or have a chance to know <laughs> everyone in here. This is where you start. And what I would also say is to lean into, if you find one person that says yes or even doesn't run away, come on, we're starting from zero, right? You know? <laughs> Talk to that person about who else do they know. You're like you build your tribe, but build from your successes. You know, don't say I went to primetime VC, I met no one, so I'm going back the next time because it's going to be awesome. What you say is I went to primetime VC, <laughs> I met ten people, they were the bomb. I'm there every single time. You know, and so lean into what's working. Starts with one. It Take a shot every time we say primetime VC. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, I'm actually trying to scan it to vote for Owen. Right now. It's like but that's just me. BC. You want to see the results for this question? There we go. All right, Olivia. There we go. Clap it up for her. It's all right. Let's, let's get a little, little, little craziness in here. All right. Good stuff. And the hall's still right there, though. All right. Just, I don't know if I mentioned this. Two get cut. Two make to the finals. One gets the belt. So I just want to reiterate that. Very important stuff here. All right, next question. We're on our third question. Four questions in the first uh, round. So uh, third question. This is a little bit of a debate question. We put this in here so maybe you can, you know, go against each other here. But will VCs start using ChatGPT or Google's BARD as an investment tool? And what are the risks and rewards? And Nia, I'm going to have you start off. So I actually used Chat asked ChatGPT in BARD what they thought about that. And they felt like there were a lot of inaccuracies. Like they were actually very concerned that VCs would actually depend on them to make decisions. They were like a lot of data set biases, a lot of possible inaccuracies, et cetera, et cetera. You guys all know. But I think personally for me, I think I would use ChatGPT to help with like writing, just like kind of just like getting my thoughts out, just writing it down because. We're pressed for time and writing takes forever. Um, but then I think I would just use perplexity AI for research because um, it's easy for you to ask a question, it comes up with an answer, and it actually cites the sources and the links actually work. Because if any of you guys know, if you tried to ask chat GPT for a source about anything, the links are always dead. I feel like they're just making up links, to be honest. <laughs> Olin. So let's say hypothetically that I just left my job and I was hypothetically thinking about starting a new fund. Uh, probably the first hire I would do is going to be a CTO. Uh, because uh, this question about whether VCs are going to use chat GPT, I think in a broader sense, we're at the point where our industry, which invests in innovation all the time, is actually going to be forced to innovate ourselves. You know, And um, the world is changing. So are they going to be using chat GPT? Yes, maybe not the version that exists today, but I think this has been the light bulb that says, you know what, it's time for us to start eating our own cooking and get into the game. And so venture capital in the next 10 years, even five years, there will be technology companies themselves. All right, Olivia. I feel like I wish I could be a contrarian and say like, no, no one's gonna use this, but I'm onboarding two engineers on Monday to do this, so I feel like I have to say yes. Um, I definitely agree with that. I think that you know my COO and I have been talking a lot about that CTOs are now gonna be the new kind of MBAs for venture funds. Um, in the short term, I think people are using it to help augment in terms of how they're writing memos and very minor things. But I think at Forum, we're thinking a lot about how do you use large language models to operate, operationalize and create processes around the investing process. Um, 
There's a lot of funds. I'm sure if some of you guys subscribe to Term Sheet, they, in their newsletter on Wednesday, they posted about this. Moonfire is a UK-based firm. Um, they have a proprietary AI model that they've been using for a while. About 25% of their deals came from that model in their last fund, and they're looking to have about 50% of it come in the next. Um, but I think VCs are some of the biggest technology laggards in the world when it comes to their own business. So I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of funds don't end up implementing this. Yeah, two, two other firms we think highly of Signal Fire and 645 actually have great engineering teams that help them source. But at the end of the day, we're a people business. Um, and the best investments are not only sourced and won uh, over years, sometimes decades of building relationships with founders. And that's, that's something AI can't do. I, I'd love to have uh, AI as an input as like one objective input to not only gather information, by the way, BARD over a open AI for sure, because uh, BARD is live data on Google. Uh, open AI still has the archive. I think Bing is just cutting a deal with them, but um, if you want to talk about stocks today or who won you know, uh, the last NBA Finals game, like open AI has no clue. Um, but as an input, I think it's, it's interesting. Um, but to make a decision, you know, absolutely not. This is a people business. Uh, there's a lot of relationship that's built behind it. There's a lot of intuition and gut that I don't think will be automated away for, for a little while. Says the human Rolodex. That's his nickname. Not Daddy-O, but it's a human Rolodex. Nadal, you want to put the QR code up? Uh, anybody else? I think I would have to disagree with Daddy-O and Olivia on, like, um, AI being the driver for VC funds. I think... Um, like Nahal said, it's based on relationships. But additionally, too, with VC, we're looking at like products and tech that have no precedence. They have no, they have no like previous iterations. Like it's completely new. So how can you really have a data set that doesn't represent what you're trying to evaluate? It just makes no sense. Like I've done models where it's hard to even find comparables because the concept is so new. So I'm just not sure. Like I think AI could help, but I think there's always going to be that judgment aspect to VC. I see you, you, you want to jump in there. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I do agree with that. I think venture is, although very transactional, also a people business. Um, but I think there's going to be a greater emphasis too on what people are doing to be able to win deals just because you can find the best deals doesn't mean you can get into them. Um, and so I think how teams think about post-investment portfolio support is going to become increasingly important. One more thing. Yeah, oh, one, go ahead. One more thing with that. So just to, to use a real-life example of, of how technology helps. I raised my uh, first fund 2018, um, you know, used technology that was available at that time to talk to 10,000, to reach out to 10,000 people and get 800 investors into a single fund. Um, you know, today that, you know, has expanded. If I were to start again with, with using the latest tools, I think once again there's an opportunity to really take a step function and reimagine, reimagine how venture capital funds are raised and operated and function. And so I think it's a nuance. I think chat BG, GPT and Altex will be used. I, I agree with uh, Nahal. It's not going to overtake venture capital. We're not going to turn into robots. But more and more, I think it's like the financial services industry where the financial planner, because of technology, instead of being able to handle 10 clients, can serve 500 clients better because of the technology behind them. And so when I say use it, I mean use it as a tool and not as an overlord. Here's a little extra question I'll just throw in there. How about founders who are about to go through a fundraise using this technology? And short, sweet answers, anybody got anything to that? She says going through a fundraise, how can he use ChatGPT or, or Google Bard? Like, you can use, like, Maybe not chat GPT specifically, but they think there are AI programs that make you that make decks for you faster. So you don't have to like spend all the time like designing, moving that pixel that way or the pixel the other way. You can just like put in your thoughts and it makes you a deck. Okay. Let's see the uh, results. Nadal. Nahal winning this round again. Olivia in second place. Okay. It's rigged, yeah. He has a lot of people here. And he gave this away a lot of This is definitely rigged. So <laughs> Well, I'm on the record for that. Whoever doesn't make it to the finals, you could still have a little bit of input because we have some extra time. So we'll, we'll, it's all good. We're all here together, uh, and we'll have some extra time to network as well. So let's move on to the last question before the cut into the finals. So how important is it for founders 
to understand exactly how they build a defensibility moat around their product at pre-seed seed stage. Olivia? So we invest in uh, mostly pre-seed, seed stage, B2B SaaS businesses. Most of those businesses, when we are investing them, are not very defensible. Um, I do think it's important for a founder, just like you want to know what levers you can pull to drive growth in your business, you should also understand what you can do to build defensibility around the product, whether it's a platform play, maybe there's a regulatory hurdle that you're first to market, there's a lot of speed, but... Um, we think about there's a lot of early players in the game at the seed stage. Uh, capitalization comes into play as you get into later stages, but I would say having an understanding of that, we're certainly not uh, married to that as one of the criteria when we're writing a check. No? We used to, you know, uh, my partners and I are engineers, and we used to think that um, the ultimate moat at the earliest stage, seed and pre-seed, was some sort of proprietary tech. And we used to think that a team with a PhD as a co-founder or this really interesting IP would be defensible and, and win. And uh, as we realized over the years, uh, that was a farce. And tech in general gets commoditized over time and, and no longer is, is an effective moat. And so what we think the moat is, is um, you know we bet on, on the jockey, not the horse. It's the founders. And specifically, I think in this environment, uh, their go-to-market ability. So there's so much epic, low-code, no-code stuff today, right? We talked about OpenAI, we talked about BART, all these APIs, where AI is commoditized, uh, everybody's access to the same thing. But the founders that break through walls, that know how to literally not only sell ice to an Eskimo, right? But, um, but also like transform you know, uh, this company to get through product market fit, um, that is the ultimate mode. So I think it depends on what you mean by defensibility. I think if it's like in the sense of like, okay, somebody has copied my idea and we have to compete, I'm not as worried about that. I think if no one's trying to copy you, it means your idea probably sucks. But um, but just aside from that, like your differentiator in that sense is like execution and the community around your products. Because if you have like good execution, you can get to market faster and really capitalize on your opportunity. But if you have a good community around your product, that means that's higher switching costs and people are going to be more loyal to you, which means that your customer acquisition costs will be lower, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's that. But if you're in the situation of like your actual product idea can be easily like commoditized by like an established player and just integrated into an already established product, like if it's a basically if it's a startup that should be a feature, then you should be worried and probably should go back to the drawing board. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've seen pre-seed and even sometimes seed founders who are actually working against themselves because they're so concerned about building a moat that they've lost sight of first having something that's worth putting a moat around. And so what I would say to everyone is create something that's valuable and that people will pay for and obviously be conscious of your IP. But again, the best idea is actually expand the market, right? Uh, they, they create more people, more interest. Um, a market that only has one winner is, is very, very rare, right? And, um, and most seed stage companies have no, no chance of um, getting that kind of capital. You're talking about open AI, first, first check $400 million, right? That's, that's someone that has their eye on the entire market, but that is not normal. So I think it is what we're saying in some similarity of a thread, focus on building a great uh, business, a great product, proving out that there's value, be aware of the, you know, the defensibility, but offense is your best defense when you're starting out. Any last words here? This is the last question before the cut, so feel free to jump in. Nadal's gonna put up the QR code, but go ahead and, I mean, did we miss anything here? We had to miss something. Don't be shy. No, we all said the same thing, which was execution is everything. Like at the end of the day, I, he, so many founders come and pitch us like we've been building this technology for five years and I'm like amazing like they're like it's about to go live and I'm like well have you talked to any customers like no but it's amazing and like so much of that too is you haven't done good customer discovery like the best products are built alongside your customers loop in people early as design partners build that into your early pilots convert those sales so you don't have to sell them twice like Building and executing is the number one thing. I think a lot of founders spend too much time inside their business versus outside in the world. 
Yeah, I agree. Like, I think especially with like with dev tools, because like one thing I've noticed with like the best dev tools is that there is like this kind of hyper community around the business. Like there's a lot of like ex there's a lot of there's an active discord community. The Twitter is like people are talking about the Twitter and talking about what they've created. And once you have that like community at like the hobbyist or even at like the individual contributor level, then it's easier to sell to businesses, which is we all know where the money is. So it's easy for people for when employees take their tools with them and product leaders definitely know like, OK, the tools that their devs prefer and you want to be that tool that the best devs prefer. OK. All right. Let's see the results. And um, this is a cumulative. Olin taking the round. Good for you, Olin. I like that. Daddy O taking the round right now. Um, what we're going to do is Gene is going to calculate, do some mathematics over there. Top two, Nahal and Olivia, give it up for the finalists right here. All right. <laughs> Don't worry, you guys aren't like completely out. We're, I'm going to get some opinions from you here, but it's going to be focused on the top two. I'd like to nominate Daddy O for a fan favorite award. Yeah. <laughs> Plus one. First question is around cap table. What's the ideal number to allocate for an employee option pool? Why is it important? And do you require the pool to be implemented before you, your investment? Uh, Olivia, you're closest to me, so why don't you go? Perfect. Yeah. Uh, we generally see at the early stage about 10% allocated to the option pool, a good incentive structure for your early employees who are coming onto the business. As you scale, we see that go anywhere from 10 to 20%. Um, given that we work with founders, we have a studio as well, so as early as like I have an idea and I want to build a product, we don't require that to be in place before we invest, but um, generally we see at the early stage about 10%. Same, 10% uh, after the round, usually especially after the Series A, I think you want to be very um, you know, sensitive to dilution, um, and the later stages when you raise, ideally the dilution is a little bit less. So, you know, founders maybe start at 30% or 20% dilution, and ideally at the Series C and D, it's it gets down to 5%. So take your option pool when you're not necessarily taking the most dramatic dilution from investors uh, is what we recommend. Uh, and then the other good advice is give everybody something. You know, every, every employee uh, is a team member and should feel ownership. And it can start at 0.1%, you know, and, and going up. And it's vesting over four years anyway with the 12-month cliff. So somebody leaves 11 months in, um, it goes back to the pool. But this way, everybody feels like they're on the team to win. Uh, any cap table advice uh, from the crew over here that is not in the finals? I think they pretty much got it. Olin? Wait, are you going to give your speech? <laughs> Fidelity cap table management? Yes. 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 Know, well, yeah, we'll be clipping this out, and don't worry, it'll be <laughs> nice. Uh, that's why I'm asking a little extra question to Olin. But uh, Olin, anything cap and table advice or tips and tricks yeah. on cap table, potentially with Fidelity and Shoebox cap table? Not, <laughs> not the other guys, but go Yeah, ahead. excellent. Uh, excellent idea. And uh, one of the things we say um, is actually it, for us to cap table to management starts with the founder's dreams. Like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Are you a serial entrepreneur and you have lots of great ideas? The one you're executing now is the one for now, but you have a thousand others? Or is this company your life? Right. When you answer that question, and it changes, but when you answer that question, your cap table advice is, if you're a serial entrepreneur, we need to get you to your first exit as fast as possible because we need to get you that capital to get onto your next idea. Don't worry about the pennies in the cap table. If you know, if if you're going to be the next owner of Fidelity and you want to be, you know, president forever, then you need to fight for every single point of of cap capital you do. And then we come in, come in saying we're here to help the founders. We're going to ride along with your journey. Journey. We're the one that bought into your excitement. You pick your journey. We'll help you get there. And in the end, it'll work out for everyone. All right, cool. Let's move on. Uh, thank you, Olin. Appreciate that. If you could invest in one seed fund besides your own, which would it be and why? Oh. What was the name of your fund again? <laughs> Foreign Ventures. Foreign Ventures. <laughs> because she's awesome. All right. I don't got? know if I could pick one, but I was chatting earlier today about Insider posted their like top 100 women or top 100 in seed. They're like, here are 100 amazing investors who are crushing it at the seed stage. And there were six women on this list of 100 people, which I feel like is not representative. But, but there were three in the picture. Yeah, there was three there in the picture three of the, the six, six people, people in the picture. 
were one women, the, and then one of six. them was also Serena Williams, which like she's amazing, but like come on, you know you're already the best athlete goat. in, she's in the all goat. the time. She is. <laughs> But um, I honestly would not invest in one seed fund. I would put a put a bunch of money into a bunch of emerging female managers. Olin, uh, Nia, any seed funds that stand out? Quick. I would say Eniac Ventures. Um, I've Boom. always, I actually listened to your podcast when I was interviewing for your funds for an internship <laughs> last <laughs> summer, and I was just like really appreciated like your background in entertainment and I think as a consumer person so yeah thank you very much Olin Ventures that's that's my answer <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much uh, the truth to matter between uh, Percy and the and the Motley Fool Ventures we, we're already we invested in roughly 15 funds so it's, it's impossible for me to kind of pick one so I'm gonna okay. pass all on right. that that's why you're not in the finals you know that wasn't the best <laughs> answer that's all right it's okay all right so the but last I, yeah, question we like to have my, a little uh, bit of fun with this so Bessemer's betting a billion dollars on AI if you could bet a billion on anything, where are you placing your chips, Olivia? Okay, so if I had a billion dollars, I wouldn't be betting it. But um, I was out to dinner uh, last week with a bunch of women who also work in venture. And we had some really honest conversations about being an adult in your 30s, making friends in New York, this like feeling of loneliness. You live in this city that's like has all these people, is super connected. And sometimes you're just like, man, like what's going on? What, what's, why is it so hard to make friends? The U.S. Surgeon General just announced that loneliness is uh, an epidemic in the U.S. and one of two adults are suffering from severe loneliness. And this is extremely expensive from like a health and wellness standpoint in the United States. So if I had a billion dollars, I wouldn't be betting it. I'd be putting it into uh, different types of initiatives that help connect people and build senses of community. Uh, it's a good question, Charlie. Um, we actually had our AGM on Tuesday, our, which is our uh, annual general meeting at, at ENIAC. And um, we had this amazing um, unicorn founder, um, a woman who uh, everybody knows, I'm not going to say her name. But she is now one of our founders. And she was mentioning that it, it was very rare. I didn't realize this statistic. Obviously, we know there's very few and far between women. and in general, underrepresented founders who have built unicorns and decacorns. But after they do build a unicorn, the percentage of folks that go on to create another business, so the repeat founder underrepresented unicorn quotient is like extraordinarily low. And she was telling us that uh, it is ridiculous that I'm literally like the only woman, <laughs> like unicorn founder starting another company. Uh, that she knows, and we did the math, and there's very, very few businesses. So um, I got to say, we love repeat founders because they see around corners. Uh, they got the scar tissue to, to prove it, and we all have to do a much better job of getting more underrepresented founders into the ecosystem. And so I would use that billion dollars to find every uh, underrepresented founder that's built a, a meaningful business and has exited or uh, otherwise and back them again and back up the truck to them again. And let's fucking go. All right, all right, Hell let's yeah. put up the QR code here. Give me that belt. Give me that belt, give it back to me. You're not getting this. Uh, put up the QR code, everybody vote. Winner gets this belt, primetime VC belt. I actually have one at home, so. <laughs> it's a little bit of home brag. As, as they're voting, uh, do you guys have any good, que uh, good question I'd like to ask? Is uh, any tips or tricks are on the best pitches that you've seen, maybe founders have come through, some that stood out uh, that maybe these guys could use in pitching you guys later on. I think just be passionate and knowledgeable about what you're, the problem you're trying to fix. I think that's what usually gets me. It's that there's like a compelling story behind it. It actually reminds me of, I was actually looking at um, a entertainment like funding platform and the founder had like a really amazing story. He was like born into a cult and like watched his first movie, which inspired him to escape the cult, and then drove him to work in the entertainment industry for a while to um, start this this um, movie funding platform. So I think just like really make that story personal and just show us your why, and I think it just comes through. Yeah, I would just say um, <laughs> it seems simple, but one way to really make you stand out is actually demonstrate that you've read the website of the venture fund you're pitching to. <laughs> I'm not saying memorize it. I'm just saying kind of get, even if you just get in the ballpark, you're ahead of 80% of the, of the decks that you come through. It's just, it's just amazing. That's a little thing that you can do. Just type in www.venturefund. Just take five minutes, scan it, and then talk to them about why you think you fit 
into their thesis. You know? That is true. You do get a lot of inbound from people who are like, will you invent in my crypto blah, blockchain? I'm like, we have not invested ever in that, so not a fit for us. But um, I think the other thing I would say, Nahal mentioned this of like VCs, when you take investment, you're like, you're getting married to one another and we're going to be in a long relationship together. And so you can think about pitching kind of like dating where on the first meeting, you don't need to tell me every single thing about your product and who you are and whatever. It's like, get me excited. You've enticed me in a first meeting and then you're going to bring in more people in the conversation. We're going to go in deeper to how your product works. I feel like in the beginning, lead with your strength, get people excited and understanding the problem you're solving and how you're doing that. And then we can dive in deeper. Awesome. Awesome. So whoever is the winner is, uh, gets the belt, obviously, and, and gets a little bit of a, cele a celebratory speech. But uh, go ahead. Do you, is it do you have? There we go. Olivia. Oh. Unbelievable. There we go. Clap it up. <laughs> All right. All right. Here. She deserves it. Take Boom. The belt. Congratulations. Take the stage. Stand up. Do, do your speech. Okay. I'll take your notes. You know. Did you have a winning have speech? A speech, no. Just, just from the gut. From the gut? Go for it. Thank you, everyone. I am so honored to be the winner of Primetime VC. I have taken down the previous winner. I'll be back. All right. But honestly, if you're an early stage B2B SaaS founder idea, like if you have an idea or up to pre-seed seed, I'd love to talk to you. Um, we're really committed to funding. Yeah, funding underrepresented founders, women. I'm really committed to funding more women. So if you know anyone or are a female building a B2B SaaS business, I would love to talk to you.